Welcome to Book Rising, a podcast by the Radical Books Collective. Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of our Radical Publishing Futures series. I'm here in Khartoum in Sudan and we'll be speaking to Omnia Shokat who runs the young, independent, incredible publishing platform called Andaria. Omnia Shokat is the co-founder with Salma Amin as well as the manager of the publishing platform based in Sudan, South Sudan, and Uganda. Omnia's educational background is in environmental studies, and she studied in Egypt and in the Netherlands. She currently manages a large team of Andaria staff in Khartoum and over 100 freelancers in various parts of East Africa. Omnia has also been a journalist and has written articles about digital media, environmental issues, gender, women's rights, and women's crucial role in the recent Sudanese revolution. Andaria was founded in 2015 in both Sudan and South Sudan and eventually branched out into Uganda as well. Finally, we're recording this conversation on South Sudan's 11th birthday, so it's a really good time to speak about Andaria's achievements in the region. Andaria is focused on contemporary life in the Sudans and in East Africa. They publish in English and Arabic and strive to sustain themselves without commercial sponsors and try to work within an independent structure. They have also published full-length books and have recently started doing many in-person activities, sometimes educational in nature, but also film screenings and music concerts. I'm here in Andaria Park, as their space is called, and excited to welcome Omnia. Thank you for joining us today for an episode of our podcast, The Book Rising. Thank you so much. It's so good to have you here and so good to meet you after so many years since we last met in Somaliland. Yes, we did. It was a good time in Hargeza, also talking about books and publishing there, right? It was lovely. Yeah. So tell me about uh, Andaria. What exactly is it that you do and what is your approach? So we've definitely evolved over the years. Uh, we started as an online magazine. We only published essays uh, from Sudan and South Sudan in 2015. It was in English and Arabic. It was just culture. We kept our head down and kind of looked for opportunities, and opportunities came knocking. So um, after that, we expanded the platform to include photo essays, to include videos. We run campaigns on social media. We have a newsletter. Um, and as more opportunities and more room in the media landscape started opening up for us, we started developing cultural enterprise sort of endeavors. So we did culture exchange projects. We've done um, in-depth projects about culture, about data journalism. Mm. So really, we're at the axis of media, tech, and culture. Mm. And we continue to evolve in that. You know, it included research. And now, as you mentioned, a publication, a book, a a bilingual book um, in English and in Arabic, also about culture, but also has a lot of undertones on politics, Mm. what 30 years did to the arts and culture movement in Sudan. Um, So yeah, we're keeping the evolution going and we're really flexible, we're we're quite lean. I think um, having worked with many media organizations on sustainability, media media business and business development, Mm -hmm. um, that's really the core of Andaria. We want to continue, we want to um, grow and whatever the landscape says, I mean, you know, you've seen Sudan, you've been here for a couple of days, you know that it's very visibly difficult to get things done. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So um, our ambition is to just continue to build our resilience, build our grit so that we can evolve with the times, but also with our audience needs and Mm -hmm. our ability to really extend, as you mentioned, like having the ability to then start events was something that we were so excited to do because we can talk about culture all we want, but to be engaged with the cultural actors, to really be part of that excitement when it comes to events and seeing the audience interaction is a whole nother feeling. And we really wanted to get that and we had the opportunity to really invest in this park and um, be able to experience that and able to enrich the cultural movement offline as well as continuing to do that online. Yeah, that's so absolutely wonderful. Um, You know, what I do know based on, you know, working with Sudanese writers in the past and South Sudanese writers, uh, you know, there is an incredible cultural output coming out of this region, not just the two Sudans, but also uh, East Africa more widely. Um, what is it that Andaria was trying to do that was, say, different? Was there a particular problem that your platform was attempting to resolve? Um, you know, for example, how come, you've, uh, pub- how come you publish bilingually? Why both Arabic and English? 
So I think our very first problem statement, and uh, I say this with you know a lot of nostalgia for you know that time, because at the time that was 2015, Sudan was really mm -hmm. not on the map when it came to culture. We were doing research on what cultural output was about Sudan, and there was not much. And when it was there, it wasn't that refreshing. It was very general. It was very um, broad. There was nothing about it that was you know in depth or try to really uncover the hidden gems, if you may. Um, so our problem statement was to give a voice or give multiple voices and give a platform for arts and culture in Sudan that was booming at the time, in our opinion, mm -hmm. give it a voice and give it a platform that was dedicated to it. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to speak both to our people and we also wanted to speak to other people who don't speak Arabic. To the world. The world, essentially. Um, especially the region. We really wanted, I don't think at the time Salma and I were thinking of our expansion. I mean, we're now doing stories in 12 countries. But at the time, it was Sudan and South Sudan. We wanted to build those bridges between the countries culturally. And we also wanted to make sure that we're um, highlighting what is not highlighted in mainstream media and also mainstream media both globally and also locally mm. um, so that was the first problem statement the second problem statement was and that was because in 2015 um, there was not much going on but then 2017 18 that was when the protest movement started picking up and of course after that it exploded so there was now focus on, mm. on culture and arts because arts was really a huge driver of the protest movement and the sit-in and the revolution in general but it was choosing who to highlight and it was kind of repeating those names over and over and you know great kudos to them and everything they've done great and it's great to use that platform which they had to amplify the message but there were still so many other voices and so many other actors that were not talked about right. so that was us now that was the role that was the evolution of the role now we want to bring many more voices in the art and culture movement so that we're not just succumbing to that you know the glamour and the fame that a few have gotten um you know on the part of the other people who also contributed so just yeah continuing to engage with the grass movement mm -hmm. to really make sure that the art and culture widely is spoken about and then of course the agenda for expanding into the region came so the the problem statement for that was that you know actually Sudan and South Sudan are not the only ones that have um, this kind of brand of being you know the poster child for war for poverty and everything mm. and there was a huge movement whether, whether it was tech in Kenya in South Africa in Egypt in Morocco um, or culture in East Africa specifically it's so vibrant and beautiful and it was coming together you know it's, the blogs were coming up the the Instagram accounts were coming up and we wanted to be part of that part of the the new storytelling of Africa so we expanded. Yeah. More cultural stories from the region now connecting those regions. So a Sudanese writer would learn about Kenya and Uganda in Arabic because they're able to read it in Arabic on our platform, but they're able to read it from a, a Uganda or Kenya writer or a Djibouti writer or someone from Rwanda. And that became another kind of like attempt to connect more connections from mm -hmm. um, our side to kind of be the platform for it, but really about the audience and the engagement from the different topics and the sectors. Yeah, you're building bridges and uh, it's, it's really wonderful because you're right, you know, even though there is proximity and in the world one thinks of like, you know, some kind of uh, monolithic body called Africa, you know, I don't think the region, you know, various regions are not necessarily in conversation with one another. And that's a, that's a great kind of, that's a r really incredible um, way to think about it. Um, you know, I ran a magazine, I ran Warscapes magazine for uh, 10 years. And we also had sections, right? We had reviews, we had news, we had poetry and so on and so forth. Um, I find your sections to be just very unique and very special. Do you want to tell us like there's wellness, there's environment, there's tech, there's a category called women. What do these categories mean to you? So we definitely had, you know, the legacy sections, you know, we started with women, <laughs> with tech, and we kept adding because the topics just kept getting more repetitive, but they're not really categorized in any mm. form. So we created, I remember environment just because there was a time when there was so many, I could say environmental scandals happening in Sudan. And we had wow. a lot of writers who were interested in that. And we're like, oh, let's create an environmental section. And um, I mean, I, I always had the passion for the environment, but that kind of waned as, culture took over, which is more exciting, of course, and environment is very 70s 
sad topic at the moment because it's all crises oh. everywhere. It is. <laughs> yes, it, it, is, is. it is. And I was in the policy part of it, and that was uh, very depressing. Um, so that's one. Wellness is also because there was, a, again, a movement. And so we're very responsive to what our audiences are saying. And this is something I tell everyone I know, basically, is that I wish I could just detox from social media. You know, like everybody's taking like social media breaks. I can't do that. <laughs> My job is to literally monitor what people are talking about so that we can present something meaningful and that it could document that moment in time. Yeah. So, you know watching and, and seeing and hearing a lot of talk about mental health and wellness and well-being and, and uh, people struggling with like procrastination or imposter syndrome, all of this was relevant to us, even though we're in the arts and culture, but these are things that affect a lot of artists Absolutely. that impact the cultural sector, se mm -hmm. sector because um, they play a very important role in, in artists who don't actually have a lot of support. Um, so that kind of mushroomed on its own and it found its own kind of like writers who are interested in it. But I think our biggest section would be arts and culture. Right. Women, of course, um, my partner and I are both feminists. We're very passionate about <laughs> everything to do with just advancing of women. Of course. And everyone always, I mean, if you, if you were here when my team was here, you would see like there's a lot more women. And we actually have guys in the team and everything, but like it's very visible. Even everyone here that works with us at the Andaria Park, there's a lot more women. Yeah. And it just happens that we crisscross with women-led organizations and initiatives. It's just it's natural. We find our safe spaces with them. Yeah. Um, so having that section because we always wanted to say something about, you know, women, something affecting women, whether to empower them or to condemn something that's happening around us that we think that can can be constructively criticized and mm. improved one way or another with solutions. So these are just, um, yeah, some of the sections. But yeah, again, I would say <laughs> arts and culture. But it kind of like mushroomed as well because yes. there's a film section. There was a time when like, you know, films yeah. were all the rage. And it's really great to see like a film movement happening in Africa. Yeah, African films especially and Sudan. Series. Yes. Uh, but also across the region, I was just reading that um, a Kenyan maker is making some sort of animation film for Netflix and it's a oh, really, really big deal wow. so it's, it's good to see you know so we are evolving with our audiences and with what our audiences are interested in but mm -hmm. also what the region is experiencing yeah but I don't think we'll grow into politics for example we're a very s slow news organization we mm -hmm. try to make things that are timeless yeah so that you, know, you can check them in three years and still know that there's someone doing something wonderful they're still there I precisely had that experience reading an interview uh, with uh, one of the actors in You'll Die at 20, the film. I was like, oh, this is just super helpful to me and it's going to be helpful for me two years later. So I know what you mean about the slow news versus like things that are just on the spot responding to like the daily stuff, you know, which is painful. And it does, it's, it, you know, it's necessary, but that's not for everyone. Yes. Um, uh, so where do you find your readers? Uh, how would you characterize your readership? So our biggest demographic is still Sudan, um, yeah. even though our content on Sudan has decreased mm -hmm. over the years as we picked up more content from the region. And as we've also really realized that content from Sudan has to go through so many different loops just because the general mood. We talk about culture. We talk about things that could be considered fluffy, especially since the revolution started in 2018. There's been so many deaths, so much volatility, so much political instability. So people's moods get affected and we don't want to be insensitive. We never want to come off as that. And if we ever did, you know, here's an apology, um, mm. you know, on this podcast. But really we try so much not to be insensitive and to be extremely conscious of what people are feeling, cognizant of the moods. And that affects our, our flow. Basically we would have tens of articles maybe and we would not be able to publish maybe sometimes for months wow. um so the, the shift has has happened you know we mm. are publishing a lot more from the content however sudan remains the place where most of our projects take place so naturally we still have a lot of content coming up from here um so really what happens is is we just try to move, move content to try to appeal to people but again the slow news sort of yeah. cycle um yeah I think I might have forgot the question. <laughs> no, I, I was just saying, where do you find your readers? And you said primarily in yeah. Sudan. So I, again, yeah. so I, I talked about the content because that really 
talks about the weed is the reason why we have the biggest amount of people from Sudan is a mystery to all of us. Because, for example, <laughs> for real, because in Sudan we can't boost content. So we're able to grow our audience in different places because we're able to advertise our content to them. Yeah. But in Sudan, it's, it's, unless it's something really appealing and people share it, people won't find you. And this is really something that is completely broken with the algorithm. And I don't know if we'll ever yeah. get it fixed because we keep huh. getting into bad lists. And those tech companies will just not list us where we can pay money to advertise when our financial system is so rogue. I see. Um, so our readers find us because we try to do meaningful content. We try to have people, you know, promote it and talk about it. We try to do the same on our side. Our staff try to do, tries to do that as well. So we try to reach our readers in Sudan through that organic kind of mm -hmm. flow. But for other countries, we've done um, the same methods, of course, um, having the writers, of course, talk about the work um, and the networks, of course, but also the people we interview, the people we profile, slowly garnering interest from their audiences as well. Mm -hmm. But we also were able to boost and spend money on advertising so that our content reaches people who are interested in arts and culture. Yeah. Um, so what is your, you know, what is it you uh, decide is publishable? How, what is your selection criteria or process uh, from start to publication? So I want to say it was probably until 2018 or 19 that I was the editor-in-chief. Mm. So whatever felt interesting or exciting, and because I do a lot of media monitoring, I kind of pick up on what people are interested in. So I either I would assign a story or we have a, a fantastic network, you know, more than 140 contributors. And people put you in stories and if it sounds right, if it sounds relevant, and if it could fit in under one of these criteria, yeah. then it's a go. Um, we, we understand that even some topics, and, and, and again, the, the issue of documentation, we want to document how our people are feeling, what is happening in this point of time. So sometimes even boring stuff gets published just because we want to document this issue or situation or a theme. Um, but m now, I mean, since 2018 or 19, there's always been an editor. And they also help select the stories. They help assign the stories. They help yeah. um, kind of brainstorm with the writers. More hands-on. Yeah. So that's been really exciting. But I think it's the selection of the writers themselves that has helped facilitate this. I can't remember how many times I've turned down a story. It's probably like less than five. Um, wow. I, yeah. I barely turned down a story because I know like someone is speaking from a place of authority. They're in their community. Mm -hmm. They have something to talk about because they feel like that is important to the community. That community matters. Um, and that has been kind of like the decentralized decision making, if you may. Um, but essentially what we try to do is then like make it fit into this, this kind of template. Um, it's digestible. It's easily read. The language is clear. It's concise. All of that. But yeah, I don't, I don't think we're, we're, we're not a no platform. <laughs> it's very hard for us to say. Yeah, that. You, you, yeah you work hard to get yeah. it to where it needs to be. Exactly. And the institutional memory, I mean, I'm still kind of like, Maybe 5% of me is engaged in the editorial process now. Maybe 10, not 5. Um, but the one thing is, like, I have the institutional memory to say, like, we have never, we have done this story before. Yeah. Um, and we have barely gotten a chance where we had to say, oh, you know, we've done this story before. Right. It's always right. really nice, really fresh. So it's good. Yeah. You're, you're primarily digital, is my sense. But here I am in this gorgeous space with this gorgeous garden uh, in Andaria Park. And I know you're doing a lot of in-person events, uh, film screenings, music, and so on. Uh, and you're also publishing actual books that we can touch and hold. Uh, why did you feel the need for this physicality, this materiality? Um, this is very interesting because it was in 2018, a friend's sister had just finished school and we met for coffee. And my sister, um, you know, was talking about arts revolutions, arts and revolutions, revolutions at art, art in revolutions. And the same thing was happening from this friend's sister, her name is Ruba. Um, and then I was like, okay, there's an open call. You know, I think it touches on this topic. Let's go for it. So we went for it. We got the fund. Wow. And that was basically how it started. Um, they wanted to do research and write a book. Mm. We've never done that, but we felt like we've managed cultural projects before. If we can create content, like one of our team members is now working on a documentary that will kind of capture what could not be captured in the book because there's only so much you can fit in a book. We've also asked... Um, different team members and also assistants in the field to help create content that could also supplement the book. So we still continued with the digital content part, but we're also adding a new thing. And as I said at the beginning, I really love the evolution of Andaria. Yeah. We continue to just do what feels right. 
and documenting things with a book feels right because there's not a lot of books written by Sudanese researchers about art and culture in Sudan. I mean, you've yes. just walked into Dunia de Banga, right? Yeah. Not so many by Sudanese artists or Sudanese writers or researchers. True. And my sister is a journalist. She's a, she's a researcher. That are um, available to Sudanese, I will add. Absolutely. It's going to be in English and in Arabic. It's going to be launched here and in Uganda mm -hmm. and hopefully distributed in the region as well. Um, Ruba is an, is an anthropologist. She's a, a researcher as well. Mm -hmm. She's a writer. And, and we wanted to capture that. We wanted that positionality. We wanted that voice. We wanted to, to have as a tangible product. Because digital, no matter what, I mean, the penetration of digital in Sudan is about 30%. So wow. no matter what, we won't reach everywhere. <laughs> but book yeah. is there to stay. Yeah, yeah, the book is there to stay. Um, you know, you've hinted now and again at all the hurdles you have to overcome to do this work uh, in a country that's now in a, a long duration of, uh, you know, first regime, then revolution, protests, you know, it's been ongoing and ongoing. Uh, how do you navigate these challenges? I have no idea. You just get through the day? I have no idea. I, if there was like a magic potion, I would tell you, but I don't know. And when we first thought, let's look for a space, you know, the art sector is opening up. Let's like, you know, be dynamic. Let's do the offline stuff we always talked about. We just kind of looked and then we looked at the bank and we're like, okay, we have the money, we can do this. Mm -hmm. um, but all through, it's almost eight years of Enderia and all through we just kept our head down and we did the work. Mm -hmm. When we needed to strategize, it was always a small team. So we just come together, we talk about it, we figure it out. We make what feels right as a decision. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a board of directors. We don't have um, a board of trustees. We don't have advisors. It's me and my co-founder and our team. And that has always just been how we get through things. And there's been so many challenges internally and externally. And, you know, there's been campaigns and there's been, you know, there's a few times we were lashed out, out, lashed out, out and, and that's okay. You mm -hmm. know, and I feel like if anything, a friend once told me that, like, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Um, I also look at the Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk examples. Like, I don't want to be them. I don't want to be them. Like, the success no. is not worth losing your mind for because they lost it somewhere. Um, and I just, I really don't know what it is, but you just kind of keep pushing yeah. day in, day out. Yeah. And you find yourself, you know, a couple of years down the line, you've got mm -hmm. a success story. I've worked with media businesses and I know this is a success, a success story. I know Absolutely. we are viable. I know that all these different transformations we've been through, the evolutions, they have worked for us. Mm -hmm. They've worked for us in this environment. They may have not worked for us in another environment. Yeah. The chaos might have helped. I think like having so much chaos makes it a little bit difficult to like pin us down. Um, being digital is also important. Ha not having... I mean, there's this trend here where some things are associated with people and that makes it very easy to target people and bring them down. And then you bring the whole thing down. And I think my founder and I have been very honest from the beginning. It's like, this is its own thing. Mm. We are not it. It is not us. And that, I think, has offered us a little bit of protection. Just talking about operational stuff. Yes. You know, they want to target you. They could do so many things here. Um, but we've ma managed to just maintain the brand on its own and it's you know, taking off and everything. And then we're just the background doing the work as yeah. we should yeah not you know and to put and to push this a bit further would you say having uh, having a, a space in uganda having a space in south sudan is that more the work or is it what allows the challenging situation in khartoum to uh, get better is that is it a bridge or is it just more more obstacles Uganda has been a huge blessing to us. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've got, we would have gotten this far without Uganda. Mm. Um, and I will just pin it to one little thing that is actually humongous. That is a huge operational hurdle for more and ma like many more than I can count. People, in institutions, individuals, initiatives. It's having the access to an international bank account without yes. so much red tape. We're registered. We pay our taxes. It's fantastic. It's so easy. They email us about it, which is... Great, you know, email me about my taxes, I love it. Um, that has enabled us to access partners, clients, work that we would have never been able to if we were mm -hmm. just stuck in Sudan. This is a huge operational problem. So Uganda has been a blessing in that way. It has also been a blessing because 
feel like I don't know what it is, but maybe the environment in Uganda, the people in Uganda, they're so open, they're so nice, they're very welcoming. And it made us feel like we can really push and go not just into Uganda, but into other countries as well. And we will be accepted eventually, we will be celebrated eventually, we will be able to use that model, which is, you know, the local voices telling their stories and just connecting them all in one platform. So Uganda, for so many different reasons, has just been such a huge transformational point for us and I could really sense like from 2018 our growth has really just torpedoed mm. and I think it is because of Uganda it's the confidence that it instilled in us that you know our business model is viable um, it's the ability to to hire local talent you know for really great you know environment and, and still be able to have our operations in Sudan and supported by Uganda and it's just a great place to be in general. Like, I love when I go there just to kind of do business <laughs> trips or, or even for fun. It's a fantastic place to just get a breather, yeah. you know? And what about Juba in South Sudan? Juba is interesting because we have content there, but we don't have, like, so we have an content office. creators. Yeah, we don't have an office there. Um, we had a couple of partnerships where we did, like, events, trainings and such, but mm -hmm. that had stopped. We had hoped that we could actually do cultural exchanges here between Juba and Sudan, but we weren't able to just because when we launched the space, it was right after it, that we had the coup. Um, so moving people in and out is not as easy because, I mean, it's just a hassle because anything could happen. There's so much volatility. But we still continue to hope that we can have a um, culture exchange project between Sudan and, and, and South Sudan. We had one in 2018, but that was the last one. Right. Yeah, yeah well, we had our great COVID as well. So That too. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, that's <laughs> nice Sudan, that you forgot about it right? for a minute. I mean, when you're in Sudan, you have bigger issues than COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and when we were in Hargeisa, you were talking about running small magazines, small publishing platforms, uh, you know, and this is a series that we're doing on radical publishing futures. Uh, what is your advice for people aspiring uh, to do things like this? What is, you know, what is your go-to kind of mottos, anthems, mm -hmm. rules? Ah, so many. <laughs> okay, I'm going like, to literally give you a list. Um, first, start small and like be good at that very core little thing. We're good at publishing. Uh -huh. People come to us because they want to publish things and we don't even have to publish it on our platform, but it's, we are good at that system. Mm -hmm. Identifying writers, getting it into an editor's hand, a translator's hand, publishing, dissemination, that's our thing. And then that can evolve into other things. So once you've got one little core element that you're really, really good at, that is fantastic. Just take it off from there. What does that translate into? project management because essentially the editorial room is a project every article is a project then research because you're dealing with data information how do you then package it into different ways so that was our model but um just on the practical side i would say just stay very focused for at least a year and not think about the money so just start small with whatever money is available and just just nurture that, you know, core competency. Mm -hmm. um, don't be afraid of going lean for a very long time, just until you're very solidly on your feet um, and you've managed to get your positionality in place, your brand in place, your trusted integrity in place, your ability to do proper work and excellent work that you can be recommended. That all needs to happen before you start like growing and scaling and investing and getting money in and all of that because that will then help you if you face issues in the future because you know you can always rely on your trust so people can understand that you have faced a hurdle and you're not just lying through your teeth basically um the other thing is like like look for partnerships everyone who looks like you acts like you does work like you is a partner not a competitor mm. and and that has that is such a a, like a wrong perception to a lot of people who are starting businesses they always look for the competitors look for the partners but then distinguish yourself for sure but learn lessons from them have them be able to also reach out to you for the same thing um, it just creates little animosity and a lot more you know environment for nurturing fostering partnerships and collaboration and all of that co-designing things um, and even kind of distinguishing okay you'll focus on that I'll focus on that um, find an amazing partner my <laughs> partner is my soulmate like really just cannot yeah overstate that enough she is my soulmate we think differently but we complement each other we have completely different core competencies and experiences and we just kind of work together with them mm -hmm. uh, she's reliable she's communicative she's everything i need <laughs> she's such a she's literally a soulmate um, and that is important you can't have someone who like looks good in a suit and can you know bring in the investors that's useless when you have no problem sorry or or no projects or anything <laughs> um so people usually go for like the names and the fame rather than you know if that's a technical person for example 
but not someone who can complement their technical skills with something else, maybe operational management or yeah, something. Less flash, more grit. Core, core grit. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Um, and the other thing is probably just the personality thing because I, I honestly, I embrace failure. I believe in failure as part of life. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're just not hitting it, you know, if you're not satisfied with something, just leave it. It's okay to just leave things. I think like I've, I mean, it's just, it's, it's hard to say when you're like, you know, at your peak, um, <laughs> but also there were moments where I wish someone who had told me, you know, like, it's okay to just leave it yeah. and, um, you know, start fresh or do something different or something. Um, maybe my personality is just different. I do like a challenge. I, I do have the grit in me and that's what kept us going, you know, through different phases of, of, of challenges. My partner is very like wise. She's very graceful. That also has kept us going through the challenges. But, but that's okay. I mean, this is, the whole world is burning at this point, And I think it's okay for people to just not do challenging things right now. Um, but yeah, start small, focus on the core competency, <laughs> build partnerships. Yeah, Very nice. Probably. And I'm going to ask you a last question that's going to timestamp us. Uh, I'm here in Sudan at a very, it's a difficult week. And I know that it's been many difficult weeks, but we ju- they just, uh, you know, they were just these uh, terribly, uh, violently squashed protests on uh, June 30th and there's been so many smaller protests and sit-ins and there is real resistance, there is real intensity, there's also real love and hope. How do you feel? How's, what, what's your, what are you, I are, think, are you guys going to come out of this? Uh, yeah, How we are you all going to do? We will. I'm not sure in what shape though. Um, there's a lot to consider when you're running an operation that is extremely expensive and extremely visible and very mm-hmm. tangible. And as I a worry, Sudanese, like as you, as this is your home too. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to speak about feel? it in different ways. I'm, I'm sure. going to speak about it as a as a person. I'm going to speak it as a CEO. Yes. As a CEO, I worry that you know some light match or you know one of these um, canisters of uh, tear gas will like somehow find its way to our generator. Um, or to our barrels of mm. fuel and just light the whole house on fire. And then I will go to jail because <laughs> there's no way I can afford this house anyway. <laughs> so it's, it, I worry about these things, you know? So that's, that's a real thread that we have to think about every day. And we can't afford insurance, there's no way. Um, but at the same time, it's so amazing when people come here for events. It just makes me want to cry. Um, it's so beautiful because I could really sense that they are not finding the spaces. And we... We're happy that we're in a space where there's, when a, in an area where there's not a lot of cultural institutions because, you know, they're divided across town. And it's good that every group of neighborhoods or something would have like a location that they can go to. So we serve a certain demographic. We serve um, probably the places near us mostly than, you know, places across the bridge or something. Um, and it makes me so happy to see people come here, attend events of different types and just, you know, enjoy their time because that's, that's what culture should be. Mm. It should be a place where people can come and energize their minds with fresh thoughts or good music or new bands or new artwork or something like that and that is a huge addition that we can contribute to the sector as an online magazine that is talking about culture um if we don't do that then we'll just resort to being an online magazine that talks about culture we've done that for pretty much seven years or something and we've (laughs) been good at it we can take it to new heights we can expand to other places in africa we can move our hq go somewhere more stable I don't know what the future looks like because honestly, I've been taking it one day at a time. And I don't think planning works in this environment, you know, not right now, at least. Um, We can hope for the best. We always hope for the best. I'm extremely hopeful. I got this from my dad and it's getting on my nerves at this point because I don't want to be this optimistic when I'm running a business that has so many risks and so many people, you know, there's a lot of people who depend on this environment Mm -hmm. um, for different things. So I am hopeful, but I'm also ready for change and mm. prepare to do what it takes to survive this environment if it becomes hostile. Right now, it's not there just yet, but it might be at a turn of, you know, yeah. a pen or a well, let's Let's or hope for better, yeah, for better things. For sure. And have radical, revolutionary hope. Radical, <laughs> that's the word. Yeah. <laughs> radical revolution. I love it. Radical yeah. revolutionary hope. Yeah. Thank you so much, Omnia. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for giving me the time, for the questions. It's been really great. I haven't done this kind of conversation in a long time, so this is nice. Wonderful. Thanks.